I grabbed the mic, I assume that was the right, the right the one. Mic, uh, the one. Yeah, for, um, That's just for the video though, right? I need to and use the podium mic for the room. No, it should work. Um, if, it's, if it's not working, then uh, it should uh, amplify. Oh, it voice. should. Okay. Yeah, so uh, try talking into it. Okay. Oh, yeah, I hear, I hear it now. There it goes. Um, let's test it. Make out of the speakers. And then also the audio. Do you want me to introduce you or do you introduce yourself? Yeah, feel free. Uh, do you want me to make a five minute count? Wait, Mark, so I'm going to assume. Yeah, that'd be great. It's going to be, um, it's going to be, it's supposed to be 10 minutes of questions at the end? Oh, uh, or? I mean, it's totally up to you. Okay. If you want questions, cool. then uh, I can let you know, like, 10 minutes and then you can try to or I think that, you know, like, Actually, no, I'm watching. I, I think I have a clock on my PowerPoint. I'll be fine. Sorry, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> Great. Uh, so this is Aaron, and he's going to talk about authentication. So get ready for all that. And uh, at the end, if you have questions, there will be time for questions. So um, hold on to those. Yeah, thanks. I uh, hope everyone's doing OK this late in the day. You know, it's uh, been a lot of sessions. So um, yeah, I'm Aaron Parecki. Aaron PK on Twitter, AaronPK.com on the internet. Um, I'm a developer advocate at Okta, and um, the, we have a Twitter account as well. Do a lot of blog posts about OAuth and authentication and things there. Um, I also maintain OAuth.net, which if you're familiar with, um, if you ever encountered OAuth, you've probably landed on that site at some point. Um, it's it's uh, publicly editable as well. It's up on GitHub, so if you ever have any things you want to add to it, change, feel free to send a pull request. Uh, I also wrote a book about OAuth called OAuth 2 Simplified, try to, trying to make it uh, easier to understand for people who are getting into that. But I'm here to talk about something vaguely related to OAuth this time, um, start, starting with a little story about a avocado company. And uh, this, is a, this is the website for the company, avocado.lol. It's a real website. And um, this theoretical company, it doesn't really matter what they do, let's say they make custom avocados, custom printed logos and avocados. And um, they start out uh, launching just a static website for their company on avocado.lol. And as they start hiring people and growing, um, they... Uh, add a private workspace for managing brand assets and things like that for, um, the, for the employees of the company. But they don't, they don't want that to be public on the internet, so instead they stick it behind a private network. It's you know easiest way to do access control, right? Make it not accessible to the internet. Then they realize that a bunch of people are working from home and don't have access to the private network. So they move it back out to the internet and then add a uh, login form and a user database. So as they grow, they build, um, they start adding more internal subdomains, like a stats server showing like um, Munin for server, server monitoring. Munin just publishes all of its files as static HTML and static assets. So in order to protect those, there's no like database you can put in front of it. There's no login, so they just use an HTTP password file. And then they set up a continuous integration server. And that one happens to have GitHub auth built in. So now at this point, as the company's been growing, they have three places to manage users. So when a new person joins or when someone leaves, 
They have to add the use the wiki account. They have to add them to the HTTP password file. They have to add the person to the GitHub organization. So obviously that's not ideal. So they go looking for new solutions and find some sort of like single sign-on thing and set up a new server for that with its own user database and then try to tie these all in together. They've managed to find a wiki plugin that handles single sign-on with that server. They managed to find a plugin for the CI system, but then what do they do with this pile of HTML files? Somehow integrating that with it. There's got to be a better way to do this. So thankfully, there is this little cool thing that's already part of Nginx called the author quest module. And I was pretty surprised to see that this is um, its part of core. It's in Nginx, but it's not there by default. You do have to add a flag to when you're compiling Nginx to enable it. So what this ends up doing, though, is this um, basically sits between your um, sits between all your servers, and any time a request comes in, so public requests of the site go through like normal. But if you've configured the auth request module for these subdomains, before a request goes and hits the subdomain, it first makes a sub request out to something else that you define. And depending on what HTTP code that server returns, it will either allow or deny the request down to the back end. It's not too hard to configure, but the docs on Nginx uh, are a little bit rough around the edges. So we'll walk through some of that. This is basically the uh, bare minimum you need in Nginx to set it up. So you first you um, tell it to enable this sub request. That's the location that Nginx will send the request to. And then you handle that location in your Nginx config and proxy it back to some other system that's going to decide whether or not the user is allowed to see it. Uh, we also don't care about the request body, so we just have it stripping the body. That makes this request go faster because it's not also passing the whole body through. So you have this new thing. We're going to call it login.avocado.lol. And that thing is responsible for authenticating users and getting them to log in. And that way, all the user management is contained in that one piece. So how does that actually authenticate people? Um, the auth request module doesn't have any concept of what is required to authenticate people. It just says, if this endpoint returns 200, it'll let the request through. So there's this cool little project called Lasso. And this is uh, essentially a little microservice that handles authenticating users. It's written in Go, so it's very easy to deploy. It has um, configurable providers, so you can swap out. You can choose how you want to actually authenticate people, whether that's via GitHub users or a custom OAuth server. Um, you get to decide how long the sessions last, so you can decide whether people are logged in for just like two hours and have to authenticate, or if you want to just set a cookie to last 10 years, then they never have to log in again. Um, this microservice is the one that is going to be handling that post request or the, or the, the, the sub request from Nginx, and it'll return either 200 or 401. And the way that this uh, remembers whether people are logged in is by setting a cookie, which is a jot, which is a self encoded um, token, so there's no database, no storage requirements, and it's very fast to validate it. So, in order to set this up, we're going to take our normal um, stats.avocado.lll server block, and we're going to add that auth request line to it. That's telling it to send that sub request to that path. That path is going to be handled by this middle chunk, which is basically proxy that request back to the Go microservice, which is listening on um, localhost port 9090. And then um, that will, when the user is not logged in, that's going to return 401. So then over here, we have it say, OK, when that service returns 401, we're going to do this, which is redirecting to that service to tell that service to log the user in. So we'll walk through this in a minute. Um, and then we need a new server block for actually configuring the host name login.avocado.lol. Um, and that's basically just proxying to the Go microservice as well. Um, 
so that it has a public host name so that you can visit it in a browser. So with this setup, you can configure Lasso to actually authenticate users via a number of different ways, depending on what you're trying to do. It has built-in support for GitHub. It has uh, Google OAuth support. You can even point it at your own WordPress blog to use your own WordPress users as your user store. Um, and you can point it at a custom OAuth server as well. So this ends up working like this. Um, when this is all set up, someone visits stats.avocado.lol. Nginx says, is there a cookie? Um, or it says, I'm going to ask the Go microservice if the user's logged in. There's no cookie, so that service returns 401, which redirects the user to the login page. This is just a thing that starts the OAuth request which, with whatever provider you've got set up, in this case, Google. So this is the first thing the user sees. Those two re redirects happen almost instantly. And then the user sees, OK, we're trying to log in um, on Google. And then after they click that account, they get redirected back to the login page, which um, issues the cookie, and then redirects back to the stats page. And now they have a cookie, so they're authenticated. So we're going to walk through that again in a different form. Um, so it starts out with the first request with, from a new user with no cookie from the browser to Nginx. Nginx passes that request on to Lasso. Um, Lasso says, oh, there's no cookie here, so return 401. Nginx returns uh, 302 back to the browser from that config block we set up. At that point, the browser then talks to Lasso directly and says, I'm start the login process, please. Lasso says, great, go to Google to log in. So then the browser does a normal Google OAuth flow, which is go fetch the, go show the prompt at Google. Google says, um, do you all want to continue logging into this app? User clicks yes, and then it sends back a 302 back to the login page with a code in the query string. So the browser fetches the login page with a code in the query string. Behind the scenes, Lasso now takes that code and um, gets an access token from Google and finds the user name of the person who logged in, or the email address of who logged in, and then sets the cookie, uh, and then redirects back to the stats page. And now that first request happens again, but this time with a cookie. And because the cookie is there, Lasso says, yes, this user is, uh, is logged in, returns 200, and then it can return the page. The really cool part, though, is that um, this happens so fast that the user never even really knows that there was anything in the middle. They never see anything from that from Lasso. It's completely invisible. So there's a couple of different ways you can configure uh, Lasso, depending on what you're trying to do. You can, if you're using Google, for example, um, you know, anybody can have a Google account. So you can limit it to the domain name of the email address. So you can say, I'm only going to allow people with an email address ending in avocado.lol um, to be able to actually see the, the content behind it, behind it. The other way is if you're using like a custom OAuth server, then if the user can log in at all, then they're authorized. So that basically, you don't need to then whitelist specific accounts or domains. You just say, if the user can log in at the server, that means they can access the backend. Uh, the other mode it has is if you, if you want the, like a read-only version of a site to be um, public for, with no authentication, you can then um, have, have Lasso pass the request through or acknowledge even without a cookie, say it's OK. Um, but then if you log in, the backend will get the name of the user who's logged in. So you can give them additional privileges if they're logged in. So you could do like read-only public wiki, log in to edit. So Lasso is configured um, using a YAML file. So it's pretty, it's pretty easy. This is an example of um, Google. So we're going to say uh, require every request to be authenticated. So this is not a publicly accessible uh, content on the back end. 
we are going to only allow users at the domains below. And they have to have an email address at that domain. And then you go and you make a Google app, and you plug in the client ID and the client secret here. The other mode you can do is um, a custom OAuth or OpenID Connect server. So this is an example of, um, again, require authentication of request, but uh, allow all users to set to true. Um, because if they have an account at your custom server, it's assumed they're part of your company and that they can log in. Um, and then for this case, you need to actually go and provide the URLs to your OpenID Connect server. Um, the another, another option is if you have a WordPress blog, you can go and install, um, install the, uh, a plugin to enable it as an OAuth server. And then you provide your um, WordPress auth URL here. And um, this one will, again, require authentication on a request. That's basically just the WordPress OAuth server config. And now when, um, uh, so now when the user hits that, they'll end up on, the, on WordPress to authenticate. So that looks like this. But the stats page hits the login page. Then you end up on WordPress. And it says the app is trying to uh, sign you into this website redirects back to the login URL, which redirects back to the stats and they're logged in. Um, the last example is GitHub, where you can go to GitHub and make a, um, uh, so with this, with this one, you might use this for the public access mode, like a public wiki, where even if you're not logged in, it still shows you the content. It's just that if you log in, you get additional privileges. Um, allow all users true, so anybody with a GitHub account can log in. And then you go in, in, into GitHub and you make a, a, an OAuth app and plug in the client ID and the client secret. And um, so that would look like unauthenticated, you would actually see something and a login link. And if you click the login link, you go, um, you redirect to the login page, which redirects to GitHub and shows you the prompt, redirects you back, and then you're logged in. Um, so how do you know who logged in? There's another one more trick for this, which is in, uh, in the Nginx config, Lasso will actually set an HTTP header in that proxy request, in that um, sub request, that has the email address of the person who logged in. So it's made available as this X Lasso user header, which you can then um, using this auth request set thing, which is part of that plugin, you can set it to a variable as available here so that you can then use it in either your fast CGI um, or proxy configuration block and set it as an HTTP header. So at this point, um, we're basically passing that from the Lasso backend all the way up into an HTTP header that makes it into, the, into your app. So like in PHP, it just shows up as you know server remote user, and um, you can use that to tell whether the person is logged in or not, and who they are. So this um, lasso is basically responsible for starting the OAuth flow with the provider that you've configured, um, verifying that callback that they've actually logged in, verifying who they are, creating a jot, and returning it in the cookie header and then verifying that cookie on each request. So a jot, if you're not familiar with that, is a, um, it's a self-encoded token. There's three parts to this. This is just ends up as one long string. They're separated by, uh, three parts separated by periods. The first part is the header. Middle part is the payload, which, which actually has the data you're gonna use in it. And then the bottom part is the signature. If you uh, base64 decode the top two, you'll see that they're just JSON strings in them. Um, the first one just tells it what algorithm was used to create the signature, and then the middle one, middle chunk, has the data in it. So in this case, um, this is what Lasso uses to say, um, here is the uh, date that this job expires, and here is the email address of the person who signed in. This is signed with a secret key that only Lasso knows. Um, so trying to modify those will cause the signature to fail. The other cool thing is that this means that Lasso doesn't need to store this in a database, and there's no lookups when you're, it's trying to verify the cookie. 
um, it's it can be validated extremely quickly because it's just pretty simple um, math. There's no database lookup or anything. So with that in place, you can now start adding more things to your backend, uh, all protected by the same login in the front, no matter what they are. So whether it's a you know a, an app that has a, the concept of user accounts or just a pile of HTML, um, and you can just you know slap this in front of anything. This is great. This lets you have one place to manage access to all these backend tools. Um, each user has their own login uh, instead of like just setting one main password in your HTTP password file and sharing it around the office. Um, it can protect any app, even if that app doesn't support authentication itself, which is pretty cool. Um, so getting started, if you're not familiar with um, I, I wasn't familiar with running Go projects at first when I first started using this, but it's actually not that hard. Once you have Go installed, you just run this. You go into that folder, you run build, um, and then it builds a binary. You need to set up the config file. So you, it does an example config file on the project, um, and then you run it. And uh, it starts listening on whatever port you've configured, and you're off and running. So, um, yeah, that's the end of that. Uh, thanks for listening. The slides from this talk are actually at avocado.lol. And there's actually a demo of this working as well. If you go to avocado.lol, there's a, um, a link to the, a fake stats page, which then you can actually try to log in, and it'll um, get you to log in using GitHub. Um, so yeah, thanks. I'm happy to, happy to answer questions since we have a few more minutes. Yeah. Do you know if Lasso? Oh, good idea. Do you know if Lasso allows multiple authenticators um, <coughs> somehow, multiple. or you just have to go? So instead of Google or GitHub, you can configure oh. Google and GitHub. No, I, it only supports one. Okay. Uh, what's what would be the use case for supporting multiple that you think? Um, Google, make your own choice. Like uh, public facing oh, website, right, right, right. make your own choice, Google or Facebook. Yeah, because I guess it's like, a pretty common pattern for like public stuff. Um, no, because I guess it wasn't designed for public facing um, web pages. So it's it's more internal. meant for, yeah, it's definitely meant for protecting internal tools and not for just general user authentication. But that's kind of a cool idea. I could, I could see extending it for that. Uh, I had a couple of questions. Um, one is that you um, given some great points of like the pros to using this. I'm really excited about it. Um, but I was wondering what sort of, uh, I guess, cons or challenges of using it, especially because you mentioned that um, it's secure, um, but like a kind of like what ki type of capacity ha uh, of security does it have? And then also, is this similar concepts of how a lot of other sites and organizations and companies will have the option for people to like sign in through their Google or Facebook accounts? Is it? kind of similar in that sense? Um, so I, I guess I'll start with the second question. Okay. Um, typically when you're seeing like someone's signing with Google or, or Facebook button, they've like, in, that's part of the app that they've written. Mm -hmm. um, and it's usually, it's usually done as just built into whatever the thing that you're logging into. Um, whereas this is like sticking it out in front so that the thing behind it doesn't even know that it was talking to Facebook or GitHub, right? So it's kind of a different approach, um, but it ends up being similar in the end, the end result. Um, as far as the uh, security question, the um, or any gotchas around running this, there were a couple of a couple of things that tripped me up a little bit when I first started using this. Um, one, it does require that this lasso service is running so that means that like make sure that you set it up with the process monitoring thing that's going to restart it if it ever crashes that kind of thing like like you would run any other service um and uh the 
Uh, sorry, what was the? What else were we asking about the, about security as of it? Just type of like the uh, cons of uh, of using this in comparison to other. Um, oh yeah, projects. yeah, yeah. That, that, um, so when Lasso issues a cookie, mm -hmm. that cookie doesn't expire until the lifetime that you've set. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that this this does not have right now is the ability to preemptively revoke tokens. So let's say you've set up like a one year cookie just so that your employees never have to log in again after they log in once. If someone gets fired and you need to actually move their account, um, you kind of have to like do it pretty manually, go in and like adjust, change the, the jot secret and everybody gets logged out, that kind of thing. It's like, it doesn't have very thorough user management um, tools built into it right now. So that's a potential like thing to be aware of. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. That was yep. awesome. Uh, so in the partially public model where you want to let some people in, is, is Nginx set up so that it's still sending that sub request every time to Lesso? And then if so, how do you tell Lesso which part to actually force authentication on? Because I didn't see that. Oh, sure. I kind of I kind of glossed over that part of it. OK. Um, so every uh, once this is configured, every single request it ends up sending the sub request to Lasso. And whatever headers are in the request get sent. So Lasso either says there is a cookie and it's valid, or there is no cookie. And um, instead of, in, the, in, that, in that partially, in that public mode, instead of sending back a 401, it just still sends back 200. It just sets a blank user. So basically, Lasso will never send a 401 response in that mode, okay. which means you have to set, you have to trigger the login manually. And your app has to send the right response to say force the login. Um, it's you actually have to just like build a login link. Okay. So you actually um, this is how this, uh, the live example is actually configured. Um, if you look at stats on God LOL, there's a actually I think I have a. It's not touch screen. What am I doing? Um, so this is this is what it looks like. Uh, if you look at this. <laughs> Well, that that worked great. I think I think um, it worked. So I think this is what I was mentioning. I don't think I set up a process monitor on so <laughs> when I was running this, um, and I think I was SSH in from this laptop running it. Um, anyway, what I was going to say was um, uh, there is like an actual link on that page that says login, and that's just a link to login dot. Okay. LOL with a couple of parameters, and that starts the login process. Okay. Um, and yeah, uh, when the when Lasso is not running, you get a 500 yep. server error because Nginx tried to send the sub request and it failed. Um, so like, there isn't really anything else it can do. Okay. The good news is that it fails um, securely and doesn't allow the request through um, because if this is actually protecting a uh, secret stuff in the back end you wouldn't want the lasso crashing to result in the data being public. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, anybody else? So I know you're, you're not necessarily the author, the author of Lasso, but I was curious, um, one of the things you maybe hinted at or maybe I just wanted to hear, um, are you able to actually authenticate um, and specify like people who are in certain private GitHub groups, for example? Hmm. Um, no, there's no group stuff in that yet. I, I think that would be a great addition to it. Patches accepted. Patches accepted for yeah. sure. Um, and I think that would be a, yeah, that'd be a, yeah, that'd be really good use for it. It's something that I use a fair amount to try to do some, and we, we'd like to have some public-facing community stuff, and then some only people who have agreed to our uh, sort of user agreement to be able to have right. code access, per se. Yeah, um, and so, using GitHub groups to manage that makes a yeah. lot of sense, for sure. I think it's a great idea. Um, worth filing a feature request, at the very least, on, on the project. Um, I just started the server, so this is what it looks like now. Um, so there's the login link. And you'll end up seeing, you know, you get taken to GitHub, and then you log in, and um, of course it's 
making me confirm my password. Um, and we're back. Um, and if I click log out, I just get taken back here. And now, since I'm already logged into GitHub and I've already authorized the application, you don't even see it happen so fast, which is pretty cool. Oh, cool. I think that's about the end of the time. Uh, thanks for all the questions. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to take this moment to also promote the party that's happening tonight at 7. Uh, it's going to be the best party ever, so it would be great if you guys can make it. Will there be avocados? Uh, there is going to be cotton candy. <laughs> oh. Where is it? It's going to be here, uh, well, downstairs in the lounge area. But, um, yeah, here at 7. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> There it is. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask you a question fully unrelated to this talk? Sure. I just started getting started with MicroPub and what mentioned like two oh. days ago. Awesome. And I think I mentioned you on MicroBlog. I, I, I doubt you checked.